So we've come to a point now where we need to do a real example, please, of standard addition. And I'm going to walk you through the steps of how to do some of this math in the beginning in order to get the concentrations that we need to plot on the standard ad addition curve. So with this example, I want to start off with a liquid, PTFE. So PTFE, if you maybe go back and remember in the wet laboratory course, uh, we've talked about PTFE because PTFE were very, that was the common material for the stopcocks that were in the bottom of our separatory funnels and in the bottom of our burettes. And it was a very chemical resistant type of plastic that we could be using. Well, the reason I say liquid is because we can order this in solution and we probably have a bottle of it now in the lab somewhere. And I'm just going to assume that we've ordered a 1000 ppm solution and we want to measure the levels of PTFE into a water sample that was brought into a lab. Uh, but this is going to be wastewater sample, not drinking water sample. Wastewater samples are typically a little bit filthier, a little bit dirtier. There's more uh, different types of compounds that might be present in a water uh, sample, such as that one, uh, versus something that would come out of our tap. So this wastewater sample, we're going to assume that it's complicated, right? This is going to be maybe waste or a discharge from a company. Who knows what kind of processes are going on with that company? They are discharging that waste and they're doing various studies or tests on the wastewater that's basically being pumped out of their system and maybe into the Cape Fear River. So who knows? But we want to focus on PTFE. Uh, PTFE, uh, the uh, abbreviation, stands for a poly tetra fluoro ethylene. So ethylene in organic chemistry you will learn to come will be kind of representative of ethyl which is a two carbon chain and off of these two carbons we're going to have fluorines F, F, F and F. There's four of those, right? Because we have tetra fluoro for fluorines. It can't get simpler than that. And poly means many. So that means that this will repeat over and over and over. So I'm going to write an N there. N represents just a number and it can be a whole chain of those units put together holding hands one by one by one by one. All right. So PTFE is what we want to focus on. Now this is a very common byproduct for the Teflon industry. Uh, the PTFE coating is very non-stick. It's very chemical resistant. It works great in cooking pans. It latches into latex. It latches into uh, PVC. It latches into Teflon. Uh, and it pretty much is Teflon. So it's not going to decompose. It's not going to break down. This is a molecule that's going to kind of stay behind for quite some time. And let's say that we bring in a wastewater sample to the lab. So I'm going to get this sample and I'm going to have a lot of the sample, right? That's the kind of the thing that we want to pay attention to here. We got quite a bit, right? It's not just a very small amount. So it's stuff that we can actually work with. Now, what does that large amount mean? Uh, well, is 100 milliliters okay? And the answer is, yeah, that should be enough to do some samples with, to do some standard additions with. Not a problem with 100 mils. What about 50 milliliters? Well, yeah, that would be okay too, right? And what you're limited to is how big of a standard can you make? So, of course, if you only bring me 50 mils a sample, I can't do a series of five or seven standards at 25 mils a piece. It's just not going to work. I'm not going to have enough volume, right? So I'm going to have to scale down my standard prep. I'm going to have to go a little bit smaller. Uh, well, what about 10 milliliters of sample? Uh, can we do uh, standard addition with that? Well, do you have things that are small enough to divide that sample up into its portions and to add sample to each one of those? If you do, and you've got that volumetric glassware, then by all means do it. What if you don't have volumetric glassware though? Well, you can maybe pipette. We can pipette one milliliter of sample into different containers or different flasks. 
uh, different vials with a lid, uh, and we can directly add in an amount of volume to that one milliliter. So the answer is as long as you can handle and divide up the sample the proper way, you're good to go. Uh, there's no really limit to what you can do as far as as long as you've got the proper setup and the proper glassware. So 100 mils is fine, 50 mils are fine, 10 mils is fine, you just got to handle them a little differently. Okay, so I've brought this wastewater sample into the lab. So I know that this wastewater sample is probably going to have PTFE in it. So I'm going to take a volumetric flask and let's say I've got a 10 mil flask and in my sample goes. There's our first. And I'm going to reference this as the blank, right? Because we have not added anything to it. That's just simply my sample. That sample is going to be ran on an instrument. I've not done anything to it. I've not added anything to it. So that is referred to as my blank. All right, well, in the next one, I'm going to take another volumetric flask. And this volumetric flask is going to be another 10 mils. And I'm going to add sample to that one too, but I'm not going to take it up to the line yet. All right. So I'm going to add sample to it. And then I'm going to add in a little bit of PTFE. That was my standard addition part right there. And then I'm going to turn around and take this solvent all the way up to the line with my sample. So this is step one. Step two would be add a little bit of standard. And step three would be fill it on up. Take it to the neck of the line or the line of the neck of the flask, right? So what did I do here in order to do this process? Well, let's say that I took one milliliter of a 500 part per billion PTFE sample and I added it to that flask. There we go. That was my standard addition. All right, well, I would do it again because remember, we've got to make a set. I'll take another 10 mil flask. In that flask goes more of my sample. Not all the way to the top, though. And then I'm going to add in a little bit more PTFE, more than what I did before. And then I'll fill it on up to the line of the volumetric flask. Uh, how much did I add here? Well, let's say we did two milliliters of a 500 PPB solution of PTFE. And then finally, I'll take a fourth flask, okay? And the fourth flask, I would put even more of my sample down into it and in that fourth flask, I would add even more PTFE for that one because we're making a series of standards, right? That's what the whole definition of a standard set is. And let's say with this one, I'm going to add three mils of 500 part per billion PTFE. And then from that point, I'm going to then take it on up to the line with sample. So just like we've mentioned before, the key concept here is number one, you add standard addition, more standard as you go up in the flask. But number two, your sample is the solvent here. Okay, that's really what we've described all the way up to this point. I've taken some flask, I've taken some sample, I've taken one thing that I want to look at in a complicated mix, and I have added that one thing to the sample. Little bits and little bits and little bit more at a time. That's how I've made my sample set. Now, we need to take this information and we need to know how to plot it. How do I get my concentrations? Well, you do it just like before. There's no difference, okay? So keep in mind the volumes here. One mil of a 500 to a 10. Two mils of a 500 to a 10. Three mils of 500 to a 10. And then in the first one, we didn't add anything at all, right? 
Okay, so I'm going to clear that off. And up here at the top, that's what I'm going to scribble down. So in the blank, I added zero mils of PTFE. In my first flask, I added one mil of a 500 ppb. In the second flask, I did two mils of a 500 ppb. And then in the third flask, I did three mils of a 500 ppb. And all of these were in 10 mil volumetric flask. So if I asked you to calculate the concentration now in each one of these, this is something that you should be very comfortable doing. And the reason is because this is just like any other dilution standard prep. There's no difference here, right? So what I mean by that is if we had to cal calculate the concentration, well, the first one, which is just the sample, I didn't add anything to it at all. So because of that, I have to give it a concentration of zero. That is what we refer to as our blank. I didn't add anything to it. And because of that, I have to say that I did not add concentration to it. So that's going to be zero. That's my blank. That's the origin. All right, now in spot number one, again, normal sample prep. CV equals CV. I've taken a one milliliter of a 500 part per billion and I want to know what is the concentration because I've diluted it to 10 milliliters now instead. That's all that I've got to do. That's just like a normal standard prep. No difference here, right? So 1 times 500, of course, is 500 equals 10 times x. I divide by 10 and I get 50. 50 part per billion for the first one. So the concentration of this first flask, I have to list it as the concentration that I have added. So that concentration is going to be 50 part per billion. Well, I do the same thing for number two, right? For number two, I have taken two milliliters of a 500 part per billion, and I want to know what's the concentration because I diluted that up to the line at the 10 milliliter mark. I diluted it with sample, but that doesn't matter. I've diluted it up to the line to the 10 mil mark. All right, so two times 500 is going to be 1,000, and that's equal to 10 times x. I divide by 10, and then x is going to be 100. So my second flask is going to be 100 part per billion. All right, so finally in the third one, if I do the dilution for that one as well, I do it the same way. I would do 3 times 500, which is 1,500, equals 10x. Divide each side by 10, and I'm going to get 150. So these are the concentrations that I would then plot on the x-axis of the calibration curve, which is really a standard addition curve this time. Once I make all of these standards, mix them, have them ready to go, I'm then going to get some absorbances or some type of signal that's associated with each one of those samples. So I'll go run them. Whatever the instrument tells me, that's the number that I write down. That's the number that we'll need to make the curve with. And then I'll go to Excel and I'll begin to plot them. All right, so let's take a look at these absorbances. Let's pretend like I ran these and these are the numbers. So, ta-da! They popped up on the screen all at once. So, 0 0.361, 0 0.487, 0 0.611, and 0.789. Those were the absorbance values or the signal that I would have received if I ran these on the instrument that they told me to run them on. All right. So, now that I have the concentrations that I have done and or that I've made, and now that I have the absorbances that are associated with those standards, I'm then going to turn to Excel and I'm going to do what I've always done before in the past. There's no difference, right? The only difference here is that I'm using the sample as the solvent. That's it. 
I'm generating standards the same way. I'm calculating the concentrations the same way. I'm running them the same way. There's no difference here at all. I'm just using the sample as a solvent. So to make this calibration curve, I would highlight the data just like before, concentration on the X, absorbance on the Y. I go up to insert, just like before. I go to scatter plot, just like before and I plot the numbers. And hopefully they're going to turn out to be linear. And they look kind of like a line, right? Okay, so I'm going to click one of the data points, just like before. I right click and go to add trend line. And then I'm going to display the equation and the R squared value on the chart. So I've shrunk this in a little bit on the screen so you can see what I'm getting ready to do. But here's the display the equation and display the R squared value. Now remember, I told you that we really like to do a backward forecast. And the reason is because we want to see where this line actually does cross the x-axis. So if I just kind of use my imagination a little bit, and if I just continue this line on to the left, it looks like it's not going to cross the x-axis until way, way, way out here, right? So I know that this backward period, I know it's going to have to be fairly large because look at this. This piece here represents 20 part per billion. So if I go that same distance on the left, I'm just going to about be to here. That's nowhere near the x-axis. Well, if I go out to the negative 40 side, it looks like I'm going to be maybe out here. So I know it's got to be greater than that. But I told you it's like trial and error. Just play around with it. So I'm going to start off with 50 just so that you can see how much backward it will go. So I've keyed in 50 to the backward forecast over here to the right. And I'm just going to click out of that box. And I can see that the line's been extended now. But it still really hasn't crossed the zero mark. And right here is the zero, right? We need it to cross this bottom line. So I'm going to increase it by another 100. So we'll go to 100. And we still haven't crossed it. So now I'll go to 150, and now we've crossed the zero mark. Here is my zero, zero, and as long as the Y stays zero, I'm going to come over to the left, and I see that my line does cross now. It crosses almost smack dab in the middle between 100 and 150. Now we're going to get ready to get that actual number, but graphically, this is very good for me. So I can visually see what the data is supposed to be telling us. All right, so there's the standard edition graph. I've just done it. Now the last part of this is to figure out what that concentration actually is, right? We ran a sample, and that sample had a signal. Now we've got to figure out how much was in there to begin with in order to get that signal in the first place. And we said that the backward forecast will give us an idea of that. Wherever that crosses the x-axis, that's the concentration that was in my sample that was given to the lab. So here is y0, right? y goes positive, it goes up. y goes negative, it goes down. y0 is right there on the origin. So that means I need to solve this equation for where y equals 0. And I'm going to get a negative number for x. But that's OK. Because we said we're just going to pretend like those negatives don't even exist. And as long as they don't, as long as we can just delete that negative, we're good to go. So I need to solve this equation for y equals 0. So back on my note screen, I'm going to come in and I'm going to say, OK, here's my equation from the graph. 0 is equal to 0.0028x plus 0 0.3508. I'm going to bring in my calculator, and I'm going to solve for x. So in order to do that, I'm going to have my 0 over here. I'm going to have to subtract 0 0.3508 from the equation. And then I'm going to divide by 0 0.0028. And my answer is going to come out to be negative 125.28, somewhere in there.
like I said, the graph looked like it went smack dab in the middle between 1 to 150. And sure enough, 125 is kind of in the middle. I did pretty good for making up all these numbers off the spur of the moment and not really thinking it anything through. I just did it. So x is equal to negative 125. And we can put some decimals on here if we want to. All of these are like three sig figs, more or less. But we can put them on there, 125.29. And this is part per billion because my concentrations were in part per billion in the very beginning. So this is the full-blown process of solving for a standard edition problem. Now with all of this said, with all of this said, we have an issue, okay? And the issue here are the amounts that I've added. The reason I'm saying this is because you've got to imagine you want to keep things pretty consistent across the board. So if I've got 10 milliliters of sample that I have analyzed and we keep saying we need to keep the composition the same, everything's got to be the same. The problem is that in my first one, I've not added anything at all. So there's actually 10 mils of sample there. All right, in the second one, I've added one mil of standard PTFE, which means that there's only nine milliliters of sample that it has room for. Well, in the next volumetric flask, I've got two mils of PTFE. That means there's only eight milliliters of room for the sample. You can kind of see where I'm going here. These large volumes do something funny in the standard edition. And what happens is that I'm so concerned with keeping things the same, keeping things consistent across the board, and I'm using my sample as the solvent every single time. But at the same time, every time I make another standard for the standard edition process, I'm adding more and more and more of the standard and less and less and less solvent, which is my sample. Sometimes this starts doing funny things to our absorbances or our signals from the instrument. And this is the rule that we always keep in mind with standard edition. It is always better to add very tiny, tiny volumes instead of larger ones. You add bigger volumes like we did in this example, you're probably not going to get a very good line in the end. Now, you could. I'm not saying that you won't every time. But if we limit the amount of standard that we're actually putting into these, we're probably going to get some better data as an end result. So I've got two choices here. The two choices sometimes, number one, is to use a large amount of volume but a smaller concentration of stuff. And number two is to use a smaller amount of volume but really increase the concentration of the standard that I'm looking for. So number two is going to be the priority. That's kind of what we would prefer in a standard edition setup. Meaning that instead of a 500 part per billion, this actually might be better using a 100 part per million instead. Increase the concentration, make it a little bit stronger. And if you do that, you can take this three milliliters and maybe just use 0.3 milliliters. You're decreasing your volume, which means that these solvents volume-wise are staying pretty much close together. The amount of stuff that you are adding is not drastically changing the amount of solvent you are using for every single one. And that's why number two is going to be preferred. So we did large milliliters 
and smaller concentrations for the sake of the example problem here. Okay, and the reason is because the math was a little bit easier, not a big deal to work with, milliliters you're comfortable working with. I changed up part per billion on you, just a little bit, but not by much. And we saw that the calculations and everything was the same from what we have learned already in the past up until now. So we're going to do another one of these examples. And this time we're going to go with really tiny volumes that are added and we're going to see how that changes, if anything. But this was just your first encounter with a standard edition. So in the next video, we'll do another one. We'll get you more comfortable with it. That way you'll be the standard edition masters by the time that video is over.